I talk a lot. It's a bit surprising given I'm an introvert, but I'm generally talking about abstract concepts for three or four hours a day. In this permanent state of arguing with other people, I've found some patterns. I'm just going to warn you, this isn't your average what if I'll video. This is a video of the mistakes and patterns I see in how people often view the world. All of these myths or lies about reality go into various ideas impregnated into our heads by the cultures we live in. This is basically a philosophy video if you haven't already figured it out. And I'm not a philosopher, and philosophy actually generally annoys me, but I really wanted to make this video. From talking to friends who are skilled in other fields like business and tech, I've generally found we've been able to come to similar conclusions about human nature. I'm going to use examples from history here to illustrate these points, but you could use other fields if you knew them. I'm also going to have little written blurbs at the end of each of these to write about why we have this misconception and why people like it so much. I'm also going to source as many books as possible so you can read more on these topics if you'd like to. This video ignores the flaws in my own worldview, mostly since I don't know them. Reality is so complicated that we're all in a permanent state of being wrong, I just don't know how I'm wrong. These points aren't in any particular order, so let's get started. It's very difficult to be wise. Philosophers have spent thousands of years thinking about this, and of all those philosophers, few were more successful than Confucius. In fact, I was just watching an interesting documentary at Confucius called Confucius, Creator of the Golden Rule. It talked about Confucius' life and how he continues to be a huge influence in China. It's a good combination of looking like the 5th century BC and also showing modern Chinese civilization. I saw this with our sponsors Magellan TV, a documentary streaming service made by filmmakers that has the richest history content of any streaming service anywhere, with stuff ranging from the ancient world to the present, and with topics like biography as well as geopolitics. Magellan's compatible with basically any device and is 4K with no additional cost. Click the link in the description to start learning about whatever inspires you today. Number 1. Progress is Inherent if you've seen the geopolitics part of this channel, you know my predictions for the future really aren't optimistic. We're at the end of a secular cycle when Pax Americana can't last forever, and when both of those things are slamming at us at the same time, the optics aren't that good. My predictions of the future have a lot of plagues, religious fanaticism, and war to say the least. However, when I talk about this to non-history buffs, they often find it ridiculous. I've heard, big wars don't happen anymore, or empires can't exist anymore. It seems like even the idea that we'll have another major war or an empire collapse seems ridiculous to most people. However, if we look at the historical record, this clearly isn't the case. All major empires of the past have collapsed at some point. Pretty regularly, eras of prosperity and growth have been followed by eras of collapse and mass death. It gets even funnier when you consider that other eras in history consider themselves as the veritable end of history, with future wars and horror never occurring after them. People in the era before World War I, for example, thought major wars were over forever, and right before the fall of Rome, the Romans thought the idea of the Roman Empire ever collapsing was ridiculous. In 18th century Western civilization, attacking civilians was taboo while mass bombings were the norm of the 20th. Your average European peasant lived a far better life in the 15th century than the mid-19th, and the standard of living before the Industrial Revolution plateaued for the common person after 600 BC in the Middle East and 800 AD in China. If we look at an alternate history perspective, if literally anyone except the United States, France, or the UK came out on top in the 20th century, we'd be living in a horrifying Orwellian world today. Which brings us to the main point about progress, that without Western civilization and stuff like the Industrial Revolution, it would just be entirely absent. Christianity gave the West the idea that progress existed at all. The other main civilizations like China, India, or Rome thought time was cyclical, with empires rising and falling, never moving forward. With the concept of progress, the West actually tried to achieve it, which did actually result in progress. The lives of a modern Westerner now were immeasurably better than any other era before the late 20th century. However, this has let us forget that this is all still an illusion. If Communist China, the Soviet Union, or the Nazis, all modern societies that really had a chance of world power were to win, we'd collapse in the shadows of a nightmare that only modern technology could fully realize. Think of the possibilities that stuff like China's social credit system, mass surveillance with cameras and technology, genetic engineering, robotics, opens up for oppressive dictators. And then remember, most regimes in history are oppressive, and a significant percentage are now, so what are the chances going forward that some unscrupulous government doesn't take the possibilities for evil that modern technology has to a horrifying extreme? 
Number two, everything is black and white. Who were the good guys in the Boer War? The British invaded small, weak countries for the express purpose of taking their diamonds and subjugating them. This was a war that was waged ruthlessly, putting a majority of the entire white population of the Boer Republics into concentration camps. The other way to view it is that the British destroyed oppressive apartheid regimes. The Boer Republics treated the native black populations as practical slaves and disenfranchised their British migrant populations. When the Boers later gained power in South Africa, they created a deeply racist, borderline fascist government. I think this is a dumb question. One side being true doesn't make the other side untrue. Everything I said above is accurate, and saying one side did bad stuff isn't letting the other side off the hook. Another question similar to this is nature versus nurture. For centuries, people wondered if our personalities were more dependent upon our genes or our upbringings. What science discovered is that it's really a combination. Genetics affects basically everything in our personalities down to a ridiculous degree, like whether you like jazz or what political party you're most likely to vote for. However, cultural influences are also really important in letting those genes manifest. Even siblings with similar genes have those genes manifest in different directions based on their friend groups, years they were born in, etc. A person whose genes might lead them to vote Republican today might vote for the liberal Whigs in 19th century Britain and enjoy fox hunting rather than listening to heavy metal. I'm not saying we should just cut to the middle in every argument. I would say in stuff like communism versus capitalism or Hobbes versus Rousseau, the facts support one side way more strongly than the other, but we still need to keep in mind that making things black and white often does a huge disservice when the world's often very gray. Number three, logical means correct. I spend a lot of time giving advice to friends. One of the issues I often run into is that they give me arguments that are rationally correct, but if you understand the intangibles involved, they're just really dumb. I'm tired of saying, yes, you could theoretically have a drink or two and then spend the rest of the night studying for the test, since by knowing that friend, one or two drinks means six or seven and you'll wake up for the test hungover. This is the main issue with ancient Greek philosophy. The ancient Greeks thought abstract thought was superior to experimentation. This held back technology for a thousand years. If a philosopher could make a rationally coherent argument, then he had no reason to test it. This really ignores how weak and frail human brains are and how incapable we are of understanding the world's complexity. There are always more variables we don't know about, and we often don't value the importance of variables correctly. If you give me a logically coherent argument for a game plan, I'll tell you why don't you do it or find an example of someone else doing it before I tell you it's a good idea. I was once talking to a friend who asked me if my predictions ever worried me since my line of thought was perfectly logical. I told him no and that my job is basically betting against God and so my chances of actually being correct are very low. The corollary to this fallacy is that our minds are inherently rational. The truth is that our minds are inherently self-serving and irrational. We ignore information we don't like. Much of modern liberalism holds that if we educate people properly, they'll behave well since they'll be more rational. This ignores that Nazi Germany was one of the most educated nations on earth at the time, and the Puritans who did the Salem witch trials were some of the best educated people in their hemisphere. Under certain circumstances, irrationality is good. A brother and sister committing incest alone with perfect contraception and the argument behind Nazism and social Darwinism both logically make perfect sense, but we all know that those are morally wrong. Similarly, a person dying to protect their parents Darwinially makes no sense, but we'd all see the honor in it. Number four, morality is relative. Lots of cool people like to say that morality is relative since if two people disagree on something, there can be no perfect agreement. However, under the circumstances of the real world, this collapses. Let me run a test. In large parts of northeastern Africa, they cut off a woman's clitoris labia majora and often so much the vagina that the woman can't enjoy sex at all, masturbate, and urination is painful and only a tiny hole is left. In some parts of Somalia, the vagina is cut up so badly that a woman can't have sex at all and then another surgery takes place before marriage. Similarly, take foot binding, where in China from 1300 to 1900, women had their feet broken so they couldn't walk, wearing these horrifying tiny shoes, all for fashion. I think every person, no matter if you believe morality is relative or not, shuddered there, and that's the point. Evil doesn't exist if you've lived a comfortable life. Evil suddenly starts existing when the tatters are about to burn your village, kill your parents, and enslave your siblings. Something a lot of people don't realize is that when you throw away standards, you automatically get the worst product. Imagine bringing your car to a mechanic, and then imagine the quality of work you'd get out of society that didn't care about finished products quality. We've been doing this in the arts for a century. You can afford to not believe in evil if it's not affecting you. The gulags, Auschwitz, and the slave ships prove evil. And if evil exists, so must good. The truth is I don't know what the right morality is. It's too complicated for me to figure out right now. 
However, I do know that morality does exist, and if we give this our best shot, that'll be much better than not trying at all. Number 5, Science and Other False Gods. As you've figured out, my views are sort of weird, but I still consider myself a Christian. I have total respect for atheists, however. There's no way we can prove God, and so I totally understand if you don't believe in him. What annoys me, however, is that atheists often construct belief structures just as irrational as God and then tout them as scientific. Take the statement, I believe in science, for example, or science should dictate society. This really means nothing. Science is a method, one of the most successful of all time and one that's helped our lives enormously, but not a value structure. Science doesn't tell me how to live a fulfilling life or what I should eat for lunch. The real teller here is that literally every part of the political compass has at one point claimed their value system is scientific. I find communism the perfect example of this. Communists consider their ideology to be scientific, but that's based on a dialectic of history that has no experimental validity and has been continually proven wrong over the last 200 years. I find it amusing that when I argue with Marxists, they quote Marx at me and assume that that must mean what they're saying is true. I don't give a damn what Marx said. I care what actually happened in the real world. However, believing Marx saying something makes it true is just religious thinking masking itself as scientific. Basically, every ideology is based off an irrational claim masking itself as immutably true. Liberalism is based off the claim that individual human life is the ultimate arbiter of importance, something with no scientific validity, an individual human's intense need for community, sex, and social validation actively presses against. Humanists often talk about a human race, but this too really is a fiction. The human race has never acted or really existed. Individuals and groups have, but give me a single time the human race has done anything. Even the UN has representation of the various interest groups involved rather than the total human race. Number 6. Pain and Force are the Worst Things Possible Sorry, this is going to be a long one. I was once in a gender studies class. We were reading about Teddy Roosevelt and how he was saying men should be manly and prepared for war, and how the U.S. should build up its navies to repair for wars with Germany and Japan around the turn between the 19th and 20th centuries. This was portrayed as bad and a sign of toxic masculinity, which I just find amusing. This was since Teddy Roosevelt was, by all accounts, right. If the U.S. didn't build up its navy and become a military power in the early 20th century, and if American men weren't ready for war, Germany and Japan would have won and the world would be a much worse place. When people say violence solves nothing, they should think about the American Civil War where violence freed millions of slaves whose masters were willing to fight to the death to prevent it. Pacifism effectively gives all the cards to the unscrupulous who will use force to game the system. The West spent a huge amount of its social capital in World War I. A millennium's worth of religion, national identities, and beliefs about honor and duty were spent in a four-year period by getting millions of men to die to barely move a front a few miles in the West, fought between countries that were basically similar, all things considered, and at roughly the same moral level. However, the effect of this is that concepts like honor, duty, higher purpose, order, and the like are viewed with cynicism in the modern world. This connection might not make sense now, but if you look at the modern world, we're terrified of death and pain. I think a perfect example of this is the culture of safety. Lots of younger people here grew up in a world where they couldn't play outside due to the infinitesimally small chance of a kidnapping. Or think of how we make playgrounds more and more safe, or in other terms, boring, to prevent the small chance of a child getting moderately hurt. Like, that's the end of the world. This extends to even an emotional basis, where we're practically breaking our society to not offend people. Hunting is another perfect example of this. Hunting's taboo among large parts of the population, which is strange since most of those people are meat eaters and those animals are almost always slaughtered in far less humane ways than hunting. People are just uncomfortable with people outside of the proper caste being aggressive. This view permeates our entire society. The West can't wage offensive wars anymore even when winning would save more lives in a balance sheet by wiping out totalitarian regimes. A very significant percentage of healthcare spending goes to keeping alive people who will die in that year anyway. Money isn't endless, and as there are more and more elderly, we can't afford to keep doing this, and we're basically killing the future economic and demographic growth of our society by doing it, and this would only get worse if we keep on the current trajectory. All of this ties back to we don't find meaning in the world, and so suffering and death have no meaning or are thus intolerable. When these have no meaning, we basically deny the reality of life. Suffering. We can afford to do this since we're living in the wealthiest era of history, but as demographics shift and the rest of the world catches up, that changes. We don't seem to understand that pain in moderation is character building. Historian Peter Turchin has shown that all great empires were formed by a multi-century inter-ethnic conflict that forced them to develop strong us-versus-them dichotomies. The struggle gave them unity. In my personal life, when people ask me if hiking the Appalachian Trail was worth it, I tell them, 
It was the hardest thing I ever did, but also the most worthwhile. Once you've clawed your own toenail off with a Swiss Army knife, nearly had your neck broken by a flying branch, and caught Giardia, it puts everything else in perspective. Number 7. The world is zero-sum. Wealth is exploitation. We've all heard this theory before. It's basically the foundational theory of a lot of philosophic schools today. Between the Navajo who believe that if a man's happy and has a good life, he must have stolen it from his neighbors through magic, and the modern leftists who believe that Europe can only be rich if it exploited the third world, this is a popular belief. The truth is that wealth is generated, not shared. Take this YouTube channel. I could have lied on my ass all day doing nothing, but I instead invested countless hours into making this and doing research, and the world as a total has become a richer place. If you wanted to divide this YouTube channel among the proletariat, it would immediately lose all value because it would lose the main thing that gives it value, me. This is the reason that the world has four times as many people as it did in 1930, and everyone is much richer and better fed, since we've had massive advances in technology, agriculture, and capitalism. This has been a major issue in modern economics. America doesn't have super high inequality now due to class warfare, but because the amount of money you make is based off where you are in the value-added chain, and we've outsourced the middle-level value-added jobs to China and Indonesia, Asia, there's more competition for the lower level value added due to women entering the workforce, immigration, and population growth, and the information revolution has allowed insane degrees of productivity from the elite. This isn't to say the world's fair. It isn't. We should endeavor to change that. But merely dividing anything like it's a pie while ignoring how it's produced is a recipe for disaster and complete failure. Philosopher, economist, and sociologist Thomas Sowell has a theory called the open and closed views of the world. People with the open view hold that if something's wrong in the world, it must be someone's fault. Humanity and the world are naturally good, and we just need to remove oppressive structures to reach our full potential. The closed view, meanwhile, holds the world's a naturally sucky and unfair place. To see why there's poverty, repression, etc., we should look for long-term variables like demographics, geography, etc. to explain it. We need impersonal institutions to uphold our current level of civilization and not let it collapse. This is basically the extension of the zero-sum worldview into philosophy, that there's a set amount of unfairness in the world that we have to remove, rather than unfairness being the norm that we have to work with and it's constantly multiplying. Number 8. Humans are purely material. Brasilia, Brazil's new capital, was a scientifically designed city in the 1950s. Everything was made to be perfect. There was a mammoth command center and then suburbs designed for the housing. Everything was built on a perfect grid. It was perfect for every reason except one. It was inhabited by real human beings, not ants. Brasilia's obsessive official building system couldn't account for the actual population that showed up, which crowded into slums far away from the city center. If the builders had more flexibility, they would have tried to legally account for this population that appears in every major Brazilian city, or just let them put the slum nearer to the center for an easier commute. Brasilia had no spaces built for public gatherings or cultural events, and thus Brasilia is known for being a horrendously boring city that you'd never want to move to unless you work for the government. The compartmentalization of work and home has given Brazilia have the reputation for being a depressing place to live with no sense of community. This demonstrates a point about human nature, that we don't just exist on a material, rational basis. We're emotional, tribal creatures. Look at the decline in civic participation in modern America, for example, with harsh declines in every form of social engagement between bowling leagues, marriages, church attendance, voting, house parties, in work of friendships, etc. In the meantime, we've seen massive rises in suicide, depression, declines in birth rate, and rises in political polarization. Most people go to work and then go home and watch TV or scroll through Instagram. The modern world's obsessed with the material, often to the detriment of the emotional and social. We've seen this in our modern capitalist model, where people will eschew their families and friends in order to make slightly higher amounts of money. Look at popular culture, which unlike practically any era of history, eschews really any moral compass except for harm that we mentioned before for money. Culture really matters. Anyone who's worked with people from different countries or even different subcultures of the same country knows this. We can even quantify how much culture does matter. For example, in the 1970s, the Italian central government gave equal amounts of money to different regional governments, and we saw the results, with the South scoring far higher than the North on measures that demonstrate corruption, wastage, ineffectiveness, and inefficiency. This was also correlated with the measures above, with the North having higher amounts of people in social clubs, people working in larger companies and having more friends, or to say it differently, a more cohesive and trusting society. We find this in wars, with historian Dupuy having made the calculations on troop and weapons level, came to the conclusion that the Germans in World War II were 45% more effective due to intangible cultural and leadership variables than the British. This would mean that for the British to beat the Germans, they'd have to bring an additional 50% more men with the same technological level as the Germans. Number 9. The Truth Doesn't Exist 
Islam used to be the most technologically developed society in the world in the early Middle Ages. The West, meanwhile, was pretty technologically backwards. What ended up happening afterwards was that Islam reached the philosophic conclusion that the study of the empirical outside world was secondary to the study of the Quran. This was since if God controls everything, studying the outside world is foolish since God could change it on a whim. In the West, meanwhile, they reached a conclusion that if God made the world, that by studying the world they would understand God better. God made the truth, and so by searching for the truth, one would find God. You can see where this leads. The scientific revolution happened in the West since they believed in the empirical outside world's truth over dogma more than anyone else in history. In the classical world, Platonic philosophy believed that the external world was a pale imitation of the immutable forms that existed in the ether. Hinduism had a very similar concept, while Confucian China often put weird superstitions and traditions above what was obviously true. Communism and Nazism have consistently put party thinking and party goals above the search for the truth as well. When the one civilization that believed in empirical truth completely trounced the others that did didn't, and then when the other civilizations adopted similar beliefs and had similar success, we can basically come to the conclusion that empirical truth exists and is very important. I mean, this makes total sense if you work in the real world. If I drop a hammer onto the floor and you say I didn't, I don't care what you think. That hammer dropped, and when I factor that into my vision of the future and you don't, I win. The truth is always a complicated thing, and having to agree to a single truth often excludes people with different opinions, and so this can often be an ugly belief. It always shocks me how many people will claim that there is no objective truth, and we all have our own truths, and this is why. Similarly, the truth is a dangerous thing that cuts everyone. It's much easier to just make up a self-serving lie that everyone wants to believe. However, in the long term, you can either accept the truth as a guest in your home or it'll burn your whole house down if you ignore it. On a side note, the main thing you should always look for to see if people are trying to hide the truth is conspiracy-like thinking. If someone's worldview has anyone who contradicts them or provides evidence against their theory being part of the plot to destroy their heavenly goal, they're fucked. This is since it destroys any feedback loop to get in touch with reality and allows mass delusion. Similarly, by dividing the world between an us who are good and a unified bizarre alliance of everyone else who is trying to destroy the us in bizarre ways, that's also a really bad sign. The world is always more complicated than that. Number 10. What's good for one is good for the rest. It's foolish that the U.S. set up democracy in Iraq. Anyone who would have looked at the situation from a non-ideological lens would see that this wouldn't work. The main thing you need for democracy to work is public trust that people will accept losing the election and peacefully step down from power, and also a national identity that's stronger than the tribal, so the largest tribe doesn't just use the democracy as a tool to oppress the rest. Iraq has neither of these. The Iraqi government became a tool for the Shia plurality to oppress the Sunnis, which resulted in the Sunnis rebelling and forming ISIS as a theocratic state. The government that came out of it was extremely corrupt, inefficient, and an Iranian puppet. If anyone was asking me, I would have set up a constitutional monarchy in Iraq. Monarchies are the form of government with the best track record in the Middle East, with Jordan, the Arab states, and Morocco all having histories of stability, with the exception of the Saudis' less repression. Confucius was known for giving different advice to different people, asking him the exact same question, since their personalities and situations were different and thus demanded different solutions. I'm a huge fan of Stoicism, for example, but I wouldn't recommend Stoicism for everyone, since if you're naturally wired to be really high in extroversion or derive a lot of pleasure in your life from having strong emotions, Stoicism will just appear insane to you. We have to be nimble thinkers. Try not to make everyone in the world be exactly like you. You have flaws, and having people who aren't you exist lets you balance out your own flaws. Number 11. Humans aren't animals. I was once having a conversation with a friend. She was disgusted at how obsessed with sex young men are. I told her that's literally what they were designed for, and expecting anything else was silly. It's easy for us humans to think we're really special, and in some ways we are, but we have to remember that when push comes to shove, we're really just a branch of primates. It reminds me of when I was reading a book on primatology, and I was reading about baboon alpha male behaviors, and I was unwittingly doing two-thirds of them as a member of related species. On a separate note, I've found that once you factor in people's biological incentive structures and stop judging them, life gets a lot easier. If you're an elementary school teacher and you're wondering why your kids aren't sitting still, you have to remember they were biologically designed to have energy to play, which is an effective way of simulating conflict in social situations, which is probably as valuable, if not more valuable, than what they're learning in school. Similarly, that people don't read out abstract concepts more. However, when you get down to it, knowing a bit more about physics or history doesn't help with the main goal of people's lives like sex, popularity, and money. You have to be obsessed for most of your life to master stuff like physics or history enough to get sex, money, or popularity from them. We've been trained to view humans as blank slates that society can just upload whatever it wants onto. Thus, when they don't behave in a manner that makes sense for modern society's abstract notions, something's wrong. However, in real terms, were hunter-gatherer apes used to tiny communities in the wilderness struggling to live in massive anthill societies?
Interestingly enough, this has been a pretty recent development. If you look at medieval society, entire families slept naked in the same bed. Friends and families would often have sex in front of each other. Friends would smell each other's shit at dinner. People would cut up cooked hogs at the dinner table. People would fart and spit at the dinner table as well while eating with their hands. Knights were out taking pleasure in killing their opponents, and torture was a public event for the whole family. The Middle Ages was a society that was fine with humanity's animalistic nature. For a variety of reasons, however, the modern world has been pushing against every biological element of humanity, trying to make us as little animal as possible. Number 12. The world has no meaning. I deal with a lot of nihilism in my daily life. I'm normally the friend that tells my other friends to better themselves. I try to nag my friends to get a better job, more hobbies, have better posture, behave with more honor, etc. An argument I often get is that nothing really matters and we can't accomplish anything. Similarly, that since the universe has no meaning, nothing we do matters and so we'll just lie on the couch and eat potato chips, since that's what I derive meaning from. Firstly, the nihilist argument falls apart pretty easily on a rational basis. If the world has no meaning and nothing's definite and everything's relative, then the belief that the world has no meaning in turn is relative and has no meaning, and so I can ignore it. Similarly, under the pressures of the real world and with responsibility, life actually has a lot of meaning. When you're doing nothing, you're letting down your family, friends, and community. If you're a parent and you think everything's relative and nothing has meaning and you act upon that, that's just a way of giving your kid a crappy life. This is basically just a form of cynical laziness. If you have to care about things, you could get hurt and you're actually be compelled to do things. If the West had to acknowledge the world has meaning and the Saudi treatment of women or the Chinese treatment of the Uyghurs is evil, that would force us to deal with how we source our oil and Happy Meal toys. It's so much easier just to flagellate ourselves in our depression and gain the narcissism of feeling so much smarter than everyone else that we're beyond reality and have figured it all out. Having been through some pretty serious depression myself, I can tell you that the number one conclusion you can never come to for the sake of your own mental health is that your life isn't worthwhile and that nothing you do has a positive effect. Once you get stuck thinking that way, nothing goes well. Well, that was a video. I genuinely wonder what the response to this will be. Should be interesting to say the least. What a faultist, and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Or alternatively, check out my merch where I've got all sorts of What If Altist brand maps, t-shirts, and mugs. Or alternatively, check out my Patreon like these wonderful patrons in front of you. There you can get the first four chapters of my Cultural History of America, as well as the first 11 chapters of my History of the World. As well as that, you can get all sorts of cool exclusive maps, as well as watch exclusive fan videos where you can ask me what-if questions, and I'll answer. Well, as always, thanks so much for watching, and have a great day.